So fellow classmates, um, first I want to apologize. I was substitute teaching today and had uh, made arrangements with Dr. Hawley to uh, give my presentation towards the end of class and um, things got busy and uh, something came up and then poof, it went out of my mind what I was even supposed to be doing today. Um, so I apologize for that and I hope that a bunch of you still view this on my YouTube link. Um, so here it goes. Here is my uh, Christian Leadership Manifesto. Um, and before I get started on it, I really did want to share it with you guys today because um, I, I think sometimes my uh, the ministry position that I'm in uh, gives me a unique perspective. I think it has throughout this class and many of the other classes. And so I, I hope that this can be useful uh, for others. Um, so I I believe that Christian leadership should be uh, focused on uh, on the community that you serve. Uh, the prologue in the name of Jesus, Reflections on Christian Leadership by Henry Nouwen, um, tells us about the community that he's serving uh, at the time that he's writing the manuscript of this book. Um, his initial thoughts about Christian leadership in the 21st century is the striving to be relevant um, uh, by you know, pursuing titles and, and degrees. And that, you know, really has been seen. And, and even, you know, perhaps even throughout um, the beginning of our seminary careers, uh, maybe the, some of our uh, desires is to be relevant to our own career paths uh, by getting our, uh, our title or our degree that we are pursuing. Um, but, you know, no one was uh, serving a community that showed uh, him and other people that, that people don't really care that much about human pursuits and titles. Instead, now one uh, discovered the secret of Christian leadership is to be vulnerable with the community in which he was serving. Instead of focusing on the glitter of success, the Christian leader needs to understand that his or her calling is a divine vocation that allows him or her to enter into a deep solidarity with the anguish underlying all the glitter of success and to bring the light of Jesus there. So really, even though we might, might want to really be relevant to a certain group of people, um, our callings is to to the people that don't really care uh, who you know what we've done or what accolades that we have, but rather that we care for them and that we're willing to be vulnerable with them. Um, I also believe that a Christian leader is called to be a mystic. Now, um, I know that in our class, we struggled with this term. And I know that there are several that are like, look, well, I really don't want to identify with being a mystic. Um, but, you know, with no one being a Catholic and, and looking at it from his perspective and, and acknowledging that sometimes when we hear the word mystic, that it can be seen as non-Christian. Uh, now his definition is someone whose identity is deeply rooted in God's first love. And so therefore, I think we should have a desire and, and, a, and a, you know, really be known as a mystic, as the one who is deeply rooted in God's uh, first love, and, God, and, and really God as our first love. Um, within the desire to be a mystic is the concept of contemplative prayer, which keeps us rooted in God's love. Uh, Julian of Norwich contends in the revelations of divine love that contemplative prayer is the highest form of prayer. He says, for the highest form of prayer is to the goodness of God, it comes down to meet us, it comes down to meet, comes, sorry, it comes down to us to meet our humblest needs. It gives life to our souls and makes them live and grow in grace and virtue. It is near and swift in grace, for it is the same grace which our souls seek and always will. Within the realm of being a mystic, uh, we are to realize that our humble status, or we are to realize our humble, humble status and draw closer to God to form that deeper relationship with him, with the one who gives the grace freely to us to minister to those whom we to to those whom he has called us to. Um, no one suggests that the original meaning of the word theology, in fact, is union with God in prayer. Um, so, and then uh, third of all, I I believe that Christian leadership should practice solitude and silence often. So, along with being mystic and drawing close to God. Um, in that relationship, we need to we need to strive to hear God's voice, and um, so often 
um, we we have issues with hearing God's voice. And in First Kings nineteen, we see the well used story of of Elijah after his encounter with the prophets and encounter with Jezebel and and having a having a panic stricken moment. And then he goes and. And God's like, hey, go up, go up to this mountain. I'm going to talk to you. And he doesn't hear God and the, the craziness. He doesn't hear God in the noise. He hears him in a still, small voice. And and too often um, we have issues hearing God's voice. And and especially as Pentecostals, we too often expect God to give us a sign or to speak audibly to us or give us a word of wisdom or prophecy from another believer. And, and while all those things are good and should occur in the life of the Christian, um, the majority of the time, God is speaking to us in the quiet. And as, as as leaders, we have that problem of being around too much noise, which blots out the sound of God speaking to us and lead us, leading us in the right direction. And this is why I believe that solitude is so important. I believe that all Christian leaders need to find places, and I do mean multiple uh, places, where they can be alone with God without any noise to distract them. Um uh, I have, you know, I love the outdoors, so that's my number one place to go. Is to is somewhere outdoors or um, over here, and I haven't been there in a couple of years. I've been so busy, and I and I regret that, and I want to go again. But we have a butte uh, in our area called Butte Saint Paul, and there's an awesome story about it. I'd love to share it with you guys another time. Um, but it's one of the higher points in our area. It's on the edge of the Tur Mountains, and you can see for miles around, and it's and it's just so peaceful and quiet. And if you get there early enough in the morning, in the in the fall, you see the fog kind of slowly lifting, and you see the deer and the different uh, animals just starting to kind of stir all around you, and it's just so peaceful and calm. It's one of my places that I can hear God uh, speaking to me the clearest, and and really, I I need to get back to that place. Although now it has snowed, so it's it's hard to get back up to that place right now. But as soon as I can next spring, I am going to have to take that trip back up to Butte, St. Paul. Um, so we, we need to find that place of solitude. Uh, we must lastly quiet our own minds and souls so that, you know, our own inner voice doesn't continue to draw, draw out God's still small whisper, whisper. Sorry, I have problems speaking tonight. Um, you know, a few months ago I was at a camp, I was dealing with some stuff, some ministry stuff. And, um, and I went down to the lake and I yelled at God for a while. And, um, and I think I shared this in class. I yelled at God, and I, I was mad at him, and I was frustrated, and I was, I was distraught, and I couldn't figure out why God wasn't leading us into another ministry position. And I it really felt bad for my family. And I got done yelling at God, and I turned around to walk away, and I immediately felt a check in my spirit, and I heard him, his still small voice, and say, what, you're not even going to let me talk? And I had to turn around and go back and just let him speak to me in that small whisper. And, and so often we let our own minds overrule uh, the voice of God. And finally, I believe that Christian leaders are called to lead people to freedom. Uh, Jesus came to this earth to set the captives free. When, when we put aside the pursuit for success, when we contemplate on the goodness of God, when we hear his voice calling out to us in the un- emptiness, we will see that those whom we minister to, minister to in our community of faith need freedom more than anything else in their lives. Why should people continue to struggle in life? Why, why do we not see holiness and sanctifi- sanctification being lived without the threat of legalism? Uh, what is What has caused those who had, who Christ had found to con- continue in their life of bondage? What what causes you know, good Christians who who knew what they believed to, to start to fall back on something else and, and consider things that are sins, not sins anymore, and, and to, to subject themselves to a life of bondage? The lack of freedom in the lives of those whom we minister to will have a resounding effect on our Christian church, and it's happening right now. The task of future Christian leaders is not to make a little contribution to, to the solution and of the pains and tribulations of our time, but instead is to identify and announce the ways in which Jesus Christ is leading God's people out of slavery and through the desert to a new land of freedom. Um, like I said, I, I apologize for not being able to share this earlier today, and I, I uh, hope that many of you still view this. I'm going to post it on the bulletin board as well as a link um, in the email uh, for you guys. Um, Dr. Holly, I, I apologize to you for not uh, keeping my word and being in class like I had said, even after you made arrangements for me. 
Um, it was a great getting to know many of you throughout uh, the seminary uh, journey. Uh, this is not my last semester, but it's my last semester of doing a community development class. And next semester is my last semester. And hopefully I'll see some of you in uh, one of my classes or a couple of my classes I have to take next semester. But um, next semester should be my last semester of my, of my uh, master's degree. So uh, with that, uh, I hope everybody has a good uh Thanksgiving next week and a, a good time for studying for their finals on um, reading week and that you do well in your finals and, and finish your degree strong. God bless.